Hello and welcome to Anatomy of Us, a show dedicated to bringing real help to real couples. I'm your host, Melanie Studley. What's up, guys? My name is Seth Studley. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and together we are high-performance marriage coaches. We are cutting through the bullcrap and creating a movement of happy, healthy, badass couples all over the world. Let's go! Here we are, ladies. I am so excited to talk to you. I have been following your podcast for, I don't know, maybe maybe a month now, but I've seen it in my iTunes. It's been trying to get me to listen to your show for a lot longer than that. And I regret not clicking on it earlier. Um, So thank you for joining us today. Like, I'm so excited to talk about your podcast, which is uh, Trauma Rewired. And I want you guys to introduce yourselves. Who are you? Why do you do the work that you do? And just tell our listeners about you because they need to know you. ASAP. So take it away. Who wants to go first? Should I call on you? (laughs) Jennifer, you go first. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So I co-host Trauma Rewired. It's the podcast that teaches you about your nervous system, how trauma lives in the body, and what you can do to heal. I am certified in neurosomatic intelligence, and I am an intersection of that work along with psychedelic preparation and integration and using the work of nervous system intelligence into psychedelic healing spaces Mm -hmm. and embodiment work really is what I I really love the most. Amazing. Amazing. Awesome. I'm Elizabeth Kristoff. I'm the other co-host of Trauma Rewired and I'm an applied neurology practitioner Um, and I have a virtual platform called brain-based wellness, where we work to train the nervous system and am also the founder of neurosomatic intelligence, which is a certification for coaches and therapists to help bring nervous system work into whatever framework they're using to work with clients to really create lasting transformation from the level of the nervous system, from the body, and also to bring a very deep level of trauma informed education into their work. And I got into this work and I continue to do it really for myself, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm someone with a pretty high A score Mm -hmm. and have experienced the consequences of that in my relationships, my body, in my life. I, I love a lot of people with high A scores, uh, including Jennifer and their health and wellness is really important to me. And I, wanted to be able to really bridge the gap Mm -hmm. between applied neurology, which was traditionally used for sports performance, athletic performance, and chronic pain into other modalities of trauma healing, behavior change, emotional processing, because I think this framework is really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. And I want people to become the experts of their own nervous system and have the tools to create positive change from the nervous system outward. Beautiful. I've been telling everybody that when I found your show, I found the thing that felt like it was missing in all of the like research that I've tried to do and my own healing and therapy and everything. And like, it's like the missing link that connects everything together. And, and the, as I share it with the women that I do, I do women's group coaching and our clients and all of that stuff. The more I share it, uh, people are saying the exact same thing. They're like, oh my gosh, this is like the missing piece. So I would love to know just like selfishly, how did you two meet? How did you start even doing the show together? Well, um, I'm a breast cancer survivor. And in 2016, when I was in recovery for um, after post-treatment, I began doing Pilates at a Pilates studio that Elizabeth owned at the time in Austin. And then that led to me doing the teacher training. And then let, led to us forming a bond, leaving when Elizabeth left that business, I went with her. And then over a lot of nature walks, over a lot of hiking, and just sharing our stories about what we had been Mm -hmm. through, um, our experiences with, um, we have shared experiences over cancer. Mm -hmm. um, And then when the pandemic hit, Elizabeth began brain-based wellness. And through the behavior change work that she was doing through functional neurology, she was healing things for her. And then that got passed on to me. And then I started using those same tools to heal my binge eating, do some subconscious repatterning. Mm. And um, through the work of healing the nervous system, having a podcast is something that I really wanted to do. But at that time, visibility was really scary. 
feeling seen and feeling heard was just really scary until I started to heal my nervous system. And um, over the course of season one, uh, we started getting a little bit of traction and understanding what we wanted to talk about. And then season two was really shaped through our knowing how important that nervous system health and healing was. And like you're, you've said, like, it's really the missing link that people are not talking about. Mm-hmm. And so Trauma Rewired was born. Amazing. I absolutely love it. So I have like a ton of notes, things that I want to ask you that I had to write down because I was like, I will not remember any of these because I'll be too excited to be staring at your faces. Um, But uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask you, and again, this is sort of me sharing my process. So the reason that I found you guys was that I had a realization in therapy and through a bunch of the, you know, the work that I do on my own that and you know, it's so weird. We talk, this is going to sound unrelated, but hang with me. We interviewed a guy who is a movement specialist. So he was on Jordan Peterson podcast and he does like parkour stuff. And he talked about how movement uh, creates integration between your brain and your body. Right. And so like, yeah, of course we kind of know that, but as he's talking, he then starts to talk about people who haven't done a lot of movement work and their bodies, you can tell because their bodies are tend to be like less coordinated. They're sort of shut down inward. And then he started talking about the emotional side of that. And so then I started looking at, I realized that like my whole family, like literally if you look at my family, my parents, my siblings, they're shut, they're like curled inward. They're sort of closed off. They don't run, they don't play, they don't laugh. And I love my family dearly, but there's a lot of stuff when you start to look at them from a physical perspective, you're like, oh, something's going on here. And so then I started looking and I was like, maybe, maybe my family has complex PTSD. Maybe that, like something, somehow that complex PTSD popped into my brain. So then I Googled how to heal from complex PTSD and your show came up. And so I was like, oh, what is this? So then I, you know, binged and all I listened to was your show for the next till today. Um, And it was so crazy because then you started talking about like fight, flight, freeze, like all of these things and how you can see it in how people stand and their body postures and their energy levels. And I swear it was like the bottom just fell out. I was like, oh, I feel like I'm finally finding the thing that's explaining my entire life. And so it's really crazy. And this is going to get to the, like, now I might cry like at any moment type vibes, because really you, um, you, you're the wisdom that you share and the way that you share has sort of like, highlighted for me something that I've been living in my entire life and had no idea that I've been walking through really complex family trauma. And I mean like really complex, like tons of uh, trauma as a, a very little kid. And, but then when you grow up in it, you don't know that it's a problem and you don't know that you're having like a response to it. You don't know any of these things. And so as I've, uh, as I've been walking on this journey, I can kind of see how it's helpful for me. I mean, I say kind of because I'm still really, really, really in the infant stages of it. I can see how healing this is going to be helpful for me. But I want to know from your perspectives, like w- how does learning about um, trauma and the things that we've walked, like how does learning about trauma work and the impact of trauma change people on the other side, like, what does it take? Like, how is it going to help me in a year from now to do this work? Is that like a weird question to ask? Or does that make sense? (laughs) No, it's a great question to ask. And I think at the root of a lot of what you were talking about is an understanding of your own nervous system, right? And we're all born with this really intelligent and important system inside of us that is protective, right? So our, our, our old brain, and our nervous system is constantly asking the question, am I safe? And then generating outputs, which is our behaviors, our posture, our movement patterns, the way that we interact in the world based on the answer to that question. So those outputs can be protective, mm-hmm. like the postures that you were talking about mm-hmm. are really curled in, a lot of flexion, our breath can be in a heightened state of activity, our, um, our behaviors can be protective. All of, all of these things can be driven by our nervous system and our nervous system can also drive us into a performance mode where we can be connected, we can be present, we can feel the internal sensations in our body. 
And all of that is driven by the state of our nervous system, but many people aren't taught about it and how our operating system works and how we can impact real change in that operating system. So learning about trauma is not just learning that trauma lives in your body, which is important so that you can have altitude and self-compassion and all those really important things, but it's also understanding the impact Mm -hmm. that it has on your nervous system and being able to understand like in a really deep way, understand your responses and begin begin to understand that you can drive change in those responses by working with the nervous system. Mm. Yeah, that's beautifully said. So so what you can expect to get is like one hope, Mm -hmm. right? Like I don't have to reflexively go through my life repeating all these things, hope that like all these cognitive things that I say all of the time. I wish I didn't do this anymore. Why can't I be different? Why can't I stop binge eating? Why can't I stop running away from relationships? How come I can't stay present during sex? Like all of these things, Mm -hmm. right? That we talk about, but we can't impact real change on. Once we start to understand our operating system, now there's hope that I know that I'm neuroplastic. I know that the system is changing all the time. I know that it's really just been trying to protect me my whole life. And now I just have to learn to speak the language of the nervous system, which is sensory inputs, to start to get a different outcome. So there's hope. And then there's also actionable tools Mm -hmm. that you can use to start to create that change when you better understand the system, how to self-regulate, how to train regularly to drive positive change. And so you can really expect like eventually to have an entirely different experience of life. That's amazing. Uh, Yeah. I'm so much on the front end of it that it's very hard for me to you know what I mean? It's just challenging. <laughs> it, feels, it can seem really it overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Especially when you're just learning something new and it's not something, well, it's something that's getting talked about so much now, mm-hmm. but you know, like Elizabeth was saying, that operating system of your nervous system is controlling so much of your life experience that people are not taking into consideration, like not only just like your mood, but your finances, your productivity, your intimacy. Mm-hmm. are all essentially dictated by your nervous system. And a dysregulated nervous system caused by trauma can have really detrimental effects in all areas of life. And particularly, you know, there's a connection between trauma and addiction. And mm-hmm. so if you have negative coping mechanisms, that's going to not propel you in the life that you really want to grow and expand in. Mm -hmm. And so thanks to that neuroplasticity, our brains can be Mm repatterned. So you bring up such a great point. Like I was thinking of how I could ask this earlier, because it's a weird question to ask, because it seems a little bit like, well, duh, but what happens if we don't check these things and we don't do this work and we don't learn about how trauma lives in our body? Like what is the almost like worst case scenario. I know that sounds awful, but I kind of want to paint that picture for people because in, again, in my own journey, I'm like, oh, I can see that uh, I do have addictive tendencies and they always feel, in air quotes, like they're going to make me feel better. Like, oh, I'll just drink, you know, a half a bottle of wine so I can sleep because I can't sleep otherwise. No, that's not great. That's not ideal. That's not like what I should do. And <laughs> it's not a great method. So like for lack of, for, you know, in fear of sounding a little bit silly, what is the worst case scenario for people not taking the time to take this seriously and kind of learn about it? Well, the worst case scenario is disease. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the very worst case scenario is, is cancer is severe autoimmune. Um, and because we are creating states for disease in our body when we live in a state of constant dysregulation. And I don't say that to scare people because again, it is possible to create change. We just have to understand how the system works, but neuroplasticity is neither good nor bad. It just is right. So our, we are always adapting and always responding to the stimulus that's coming into our nervous system. But that change can be negative. We can get worse. Like when we're exceeding our own window of tolerance, even for things that we're doing to try to make ourselves better, even you know, self-help work and coaching programs and therapy, if we're pushing ourselves past our window of tolerance and creating dysregulation and getting outcomes that we don't want, mm-hmm. outcomes like pain, shutdown, fatigue, dissociation, then our system is getting better and better at creating those 
outcomes. That's Mm -hmm. how neuroplasticity works. Those pathways are more myelinated. It's a more well-worn path and our system turns to that to protect us more frequently. So when we don't understand our operating system and how to see the signals that it's sending us, how to, you know, understand what our nervous system is saying back to us and how to calibrate the things that we're doing in life to drive that change in a positive direction, we can stay in a state of chronic stress for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And that stress will either lead to those maladaptive behaviors, like you were talking about, like drinking a little Mm -hmm. bit too much or binge eating. Jennifer and I both have struggled with binge eating for a long time. And you'll either need those behaviors to re-regulate, to come down out of that chronic stress Mm -hmm. state. um, And then you'll just be constantly fighting Mm -hmm. against behaviors that you don't want to live your life. And and then worst case scenario is that you stop being able to, to regulate and, and handle that stress. And you get a really bad environment inside of your body that leads to a lot of inflammation mm. and you end up developing disease. Mm-hmm. Man. Yeah. And I know yeah, sounded, we use the, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Well, we use the phrase a lot, what you do, you get better at. Mm. And so think if you're training for a marathon or you want to learn to play the piano, if you get in there and you practice the piano every day, you're going to be great at that. But if you want to use alcohol or food to cope and say you just like dissociate and you sit on the couch and eat chips and that's your pathway, the brain is going to make you better at sitting down and eating chips. Mm. Like it will help you go down that route faster. And the more you do it, the faster that loop gets triggered. And then you're just like she said, you're just myelinating that Mm -hmm. path in your brain, that neural network. That's really interesting. I have never thought of that, like neuroplasticity working both ways, like it like is both good and negative ways. I just never, it never occurred to me. Forgive me if you've said it on your show and I didn't catch it, but uh, it makes me think of there's uh, people I dearly love who are in a pretty unhealthy state within themselves and just recently went to visit them and they were actually defending and fighting for essentially their dysfunction, like a, like a highly dysfunctional thing where everyone around them can go, Ooh, that like, that is not good. They were fighting to maintain it and sustain it. And it makes me think of like what you're saying. It's almost like we get good at what we do more, you know, whatever, however you said that. Um, and it makes me think of that where it's like, then it's that tipping point where you're like, I don't even know how I can help them because they are fighting for the dysfunction. They're fighting. I mean, it would be the equivalent of me fighting for my half a glass or half a bottle of wine a night, right? Um, or were you going to say something about that? Well, I was just going to say it's, you know, everything that our brain does at the level of our brain stem, our old brain, our reflexive brain is protective. And that really, whatever those maladaptive behaviors are, it's the way for better or worse that our old brain has found to regulate us Mm -hmm. and to in that moment, keep us safe. Mm -hmm. So for example, with binge eating, I'm a lifelong binge eater, but I'm also a kiddo who grew up with a high level of stress. I have a high A score, Mm -hmm. a lot of family trauma, just like you were talking about. And so I had big emotions. They were really scary. I was really dysregulated. And one of the best ways that my system found to to calm me down out of that high stress state was if I eat a bunch of food, it it very much gives stimulus to my vagus nerve, Mm -hmm. to important structures in my brain that give me important interceptive information telling me what's going on inside of my own body. And in general, it it moves me into a calm and respond, rest and digest Mm -hmm. state. And I was in too much stress for too long. That's dangerous, especially to a developing nervous mm-hmm. system. And so it was a it was a tool that my body knew would help me get out of that state of chronic stress and it carried with me my whole life. And when I started to try to take that behavior away without having new tools to work with the nervous system, I was actually, it was actually pretty dangerous. I would get really dysregulated. I would have periods of intense insomnia and I was staying stuck in that very high stress state. So in some ways, binge eating saved my life at that Mm -hmm. time Mm -hmm. um, because it, it allowed my system to rest and recover and heal and adapt. Mm. And so we can't always take away our old coping behaviors if we don't have the new tools Mm -hmm. because our system is telling us it really needs something Mm -hmm. to help cope with the stress. 
That's amazing. And now it makes more sense even when you're talking about like wanting to work specifically with like coaches or therapists, because if they just say to someone who let's say struggles with binge eating, you just have to stop like cold Turkey. You can't lock the fridge, put a lock, you know, like that kind of vibe. They're not like, there's not enough slow calibration to like the, like our acclimation to where we want to shift. And if they don't have a tool or a new coping strategy or even the awareness, I mean, you are like taking, it's like pulling out essentially a safety net or like pulling the rug out from somebody and being like, well, just deal with it or, you know, fall straight on the floor and what? And I think there's so much danger in a, and people not understanding that because I don't know, there's a lot to be said for the binge eating thing. Cause I also, it's interesting. I didn't realize that I do the same thing. I binge eat as, um, it's a strategy, but it's not, it's, I base I made a joke about this the other day, but it's like that thin sliced Swiss cheese has got me. And it's like the thing I go to when I'm like, I don't feel right. I know what'll fix it. It was thin sliced Swiss cheese, apparently. Uh, but I didn't realize that I was like doing it as a mechanism to bring myself back to calm. I had no awareness of it until I listened to your guys' show. And, um, and then it just changed how I, like, I don't know, seeing it in myself and then seeing it in people that I work with, it helped me shift how I, I realized, oh, I'm using this as a tool. It's not all bad, but it's also, you know, I just was completely unaware of it. Um, I'm going to go back to my list of questions here. Um, what, okay, I have two main themes I think I want to kind of nail here. And one is in the marriage space, so like in a relationship space, I'm discovering, so I have a lot of aces as well, grew up in a really, um, what I thought was a stable environment, but looking back, reflecting as an adult, there was a lot of like, just don't talk about all the trauma you're in all the time. And so then I realized like, oh, you can't say anything. So saying anything is bad, like communicating your feelings is bad. So just like stay totally neutral all the time. And then my husband has a complete opposite where it was like a really kind of explosive and then like repair, explode, re explode repair vibe. And in my family, like you don't explode, that would be the wrong thing to do. And so I'm finding that we've been married for almost 19 years. And even now with this awareness of uh, nervous system stuff and all of the um, sort of suppressed nervous system stuff I've been walking through, it's very hard to know how to communicate to him that like what he's coming at me with is way too much. Like my nervous system can't handle it. Like I feel like I'm on, like all the alarms are blaring, but to him, it looks like it should be fine. And I should be like, it should be normal. He said that, okay, I love my husband. We do our podcast together, but he said to me a million times in our marriage, can't you just be normal? Like, just be normal. Like he'll go to touch me and he'll be like, just be normal. I'm like, I don't know what that means. Uh, number one, that hurts my feelings. Number two, I don't know what that means. So how would you explain this in a rela in like a, a couple relationship where the nervous system like set points are so different. How would you manage it? What would you do? Help me ladies. <laughs> it's so interesting to be posed with this question. As we began season three today and recording for it, we are recording season three as um, attachment and relationships in yes. your nervous system and how we are shaped by uh, by our relationships, that the brain is a social organ. And especially as like young people and as far as like attachment, you are shaped by the unresolved trauma mm -hmm. in the parent that is communicated to the child as an unconscious process and will affect personality, which we don't really actually believe in. We believe everything is a nervous system and is physiological, mm -hmm. but it shapes your thoughts and, and your behavior. And um, you know, we need attachment. We need to, we need other people. And sometimes, you know, there's, there's these experiences that have shaped our childhood that can be really adverse. And then we have someone coming to us from a more secure place. And you mentioned something earlier, like when you say that, that just even makes me feel bad. Like there can be a shame spiral that mm -hmm. moves through the body and that's going to create a lot of inflammation. Like you are mm. going to respond to that. Um, and so it's been an interesting journey in, in my own to move from an anxious avoidant 
attachment Mm -hmm. into secure attachment. And then I will let Elizabeth take over from here because she's actually in partnership right now. Mm. Yeah, I think it is super interesting to be on this podcast talking with you about relationship today as we're diving into all of this with season three of Trauma Rewired. And it's also really like at the forefront of my own personal life right now too, Mm -hmm. because I'm in a secure attachment, in a secure relationship for like the first time in my entire life. I'm 40. So it took me a while to get here to where I could be in that container um, safely. And we've been together for about two years and, you know, there's still a lot of navigating. It's Mm -hmm. two different nervous systems coming together, Mm -hmm. both with our own unique neural matrix of past experiences and everybody has their own unresolved trauma that happens to varying degrees. And, um, and then it, it really shows up in partnership and in intimacy. And one thing that I will say really helps is being able to speak the language of the nervous, like being able to talk about things from a, from a neurosomatic perspective mm-hmm. together, because he knows me and my work, we can recognize that we're triggered. We can, we know we, our triggers. And we even have like a code word, um, pineapple. Um, when one of us is feeling triggered Mm -hmm. that we say, because it deflates it, it Mm deescalates it. Right. And it's like, now he's not going to take it as personal, Mm -hmm. my reaction, because he knows that I'm being triggered and being driven by my physiological state, my racing heart, my, um, tightening muscles that it's, it's calling up a unique, past experience Mm -hmm. that I'm reacting to rather than like the real thing that's happening in that moment. And he can know that and not take it as personally. And same for me, you know, if I, if I know that he's being triggered, I can have a little bit more compassion, just like I would have for myself. Mm -hmm. And I can do the work to stay regulated and grounded, try to slow my respiration down, try to speak more slowly, just shake it out a little bit myself Mm -hmm. so that I can stay grounded and present. And, um, and that really helps. And then just having a lot of patience, Mm -hmm. just like when we were talking about with coaching and, and therapy work and even somatic work, staying within that window of tolerance and knowing that I'm going to have to be patient with myself and my nervous system as I explore the world of intimacy, because I've got a lot of wounds there. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I have to have a practice of working with my nervous system around it, um, I do tr- train my nervous system daily. I, I do it on the website. I do it in my own practices. And that really makes it possible for me to start to create this change inside myself. And then that trickles out into the relationship. Mm. That's beautiful. I'm thinking about, uh, you talk about having a daily practice. What types of things are, what is, what is the daily practice? Um, can you speak to that? Yeah, we call it a daily nervous system hygiene practice. And we view it just like you would brush your teeth. We do nervous system work. Like regulation is a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so in the morning, I always have a practice in the morning. I try to hit various systems. I might have my visual system, my vestibular system. I'm doing some proprioceptive work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm stacking a bunch of tools at one time to get this big boost of stimulus to my brain and body that it really likes. And also it's lowering the threat in my bucket before Mm. my day even starts. Mm. And so we use the nervous system tools for many different reasons. Like we use it for Elizabeth spoke earlier about protection Mm -hmm. and um, performance. Like your brain lives on that spectrum. You have your protective outputs, the anxiety, the depression, pain, shutdown, chronic fatigue. And then you have the other spectrum, which is the performance, using your voice, setting boundaries, getting on this podcast, right? So um, because I want to perform well, I will do some drills before this podcast, before even we record or before I'm doing anything where I want to perform at my highest level because I want to do that from a place of safety and groundedness in my nervous system. And then we also will use the tools when we want to couch it with some scary action, right? Mm. I might regulate, set a boundary, re-regulate. Or I might regulate, do some emotional processing, and then re-regulate. And just always showing my body, see, it's safe for me to take this action. Mm -hmm. It's safe for me to be seen. It's safe for me to be heard. It's safe for me to be in this body. It's safe to let these emotions go out of the body. That's been holding on to things for so long. And so the tools are really brilliant because nervous system 
regulation, it has no boundaries. So it's going to support your your already good habits and what you're good at. And then it's going to help repair your deficits at the same time and bring the systems that are not delivering accurate information to your brain. It's going to recreate their, their performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when Jennifer talks about neuro tools, there's, I mean, there's so many, it's hard to give like one concrete example, but there's tools that deal with your breathing. Mm -hmm. There's tools that deal with your visual system, your eyes. That's a really important what we call input system for Mm -hmm. the brain. So it's giving information to the brain and then your brain's going to take that information in, interpret it, and then generate an output. Like Mm -hmm. she was talking about either performance or protective. We have the balance system in our inner ear, our vestibular system. We have a system that maps our body and lets our brain know where we are in space called our proprioceptive system. We have the system that tells our brain what's going on inside of our body. That's like your vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. It's called your interceptive system. And all of these systems are taking in data all the time, taking it in, taking it in, the sensory stimulus and feeding it up to your brain. And your brain integrates it, it puts it all together, and then it decides what output to generate. What are you going to do next Mm -hmm. to A, stay alive, and B, to keep your social connections, and then C, if all that's good, to perform well, to learn, to to -hmm. connect. And so we train all of those systems daily. We train our eyes, our balance system in our inner ear, our body mapping system. So we do that on the on the site on Mm -hmm. brain based wellness. And you can actually get two free weeks with us at rewiretrial.com. And you can start learning the tools because there's a bunch of them. And you're gonna have to learn how to find which ones are right for your Mm -hmm. unique nervous system because everybody's so different. So we also teach people how to assess and reassess what are the right tools for you, Mm -hmm. what's moving your nervous system forward in a positive direction. And that way you can start to create that change Mm -hmm. intentionally that works for you. That's beautiful. And so like when people figure out what works for them, how long is like roughly is their morning routine if they if they choose the morning, I suppose? It, it could be a couple of minutes, it could be 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. It re- and it and it changes. I think it it ebbs and flows in many different ways because you know, some days you might just have 5 minutes, mm-hmm. right? You have maybe you're who knows what's happening right. for people in the morning, right? Like you can get derailed very easily sometimes. And so it's like, okay, I need to just commit. Maybe maybe I'm just going to take one minute mm-hmm. and do some mindful breathing or one minute and train my vagus nerve. Or like I said, maybe you're going to just stack a bunch of systems really quick, 30 seconds, boom, you're out the door. And very then you cool. just kind of sprinkle and pepper it into your day. That makes sense. Yeah. I think like Jennifer was saying too, it's a lot of times it's, there's the morning practice and we try to keep that short, Mm -hmm. not to overwhelm people, Mm -hmm. especially if they're first getting started. But then also to, like she said, regulation becomes a lifestyle. So you start to learn to read your body's signals and your nervous system signals and know when you need a tool Mm -hmm. here and there, or when you're going to go do something you want to perform. So I'm just constantly throughout the day using my tools to work with my nervous system as I'm going through the world. So yeah, at the end of the day, I've probably done about 20 minutes of neuro work Mm -hmm, every day, mm -hmm. but it's in little chunks throughout in a way that supports me. Oh, that's so cool. I I have such a better understanding of it now. I love it. Uh, Yeah. You said something. I was just re-listening to um, the dissociation episode and you said something that I had, I remember hearing it and it was like this explosion in my brain went off, but you said healing can be very dysregulating and like, like healing the nervous system. And and I, it made me think of a few different things where it kind of connected these dots for me. Again, my family is very like pretty suppressed. Like there's a lot of just suppression and everything. There's also a lot of um, chronic illness, not surprisingly, but I've tried really hard to step out and be different and and not like against them or anything, but just like, I'm trying to live a different kind of life. I'm trying to be really vulnerable. And I had, I had this realization after every event that I do, I almost always get sick after every single event, after every time that I really just like let joy fly and like be happy. I get like a major illness right after it, like, like clockwork. And it was the first, and at first I was like, I must just have a really bad immune system. Like I must just be weak. I don't know. And then after I heard you guys talk about that, I was like, I think I'm overdosing. Like I'm, it's too much. It's too much for my nervous system. It's like, you can't hug that many people. You cannot be that happy. It's something in, it's like, it's setting alarm bells off. And then my body just goes, 
and now you have a cold. For the next two weeks, you'll be in bed. Uh, so I would love to have your take on that and just get your thoughts because I totally resonated with this like as I'm attempting to heal, but also like doing it in big ways. Like I'm having people over to my house and running groups. I'm not just like having a picnic with a friend, you know, like what are your thoughts on that? And give me any advice that you have, would you? <laughs> I think even the picnic with a friend could be an incredibly threatening. Like dissociation is a traumatizer in and of itself. Like it's what makes presence so threatening. And when you're someone who is a chronic dissociator and now you're in the presence of connection and joy and community and you're really feeling it and you're vibing it. And then it's like you step away and it's like, this flood comes over you. I mean, you have to re-regulate because mm -hmm. all that stress is coming back into your system. And so we, I use, like when I'm going into a happy occasion, like maybe a wedding, say this is the most recent time, like I, I want to be at the wedding. I want to mm -hmm. celebrate joy and love. I, I want that. But also it's too overwhelming for me to stay in that environment for too long. Mm -hmm. So I have to step away I've got to do some drills and come back into the scene. And I might have to step away several times or I might have to leave. But usually those situations, I would leave and then I would go into a binge. I would use mm. food because that's my well-worn path mm -hmm. is like, oh, stress is too high. How are we going to keep me alive right now? Throw a few thousand calories into right. Jennifer right now and shut her down, keep her safe. And so um, dissociation it, it blocks all these necessary processes in your brain and body for integration of experiences. Mm. And so, and it fragments the ability to lay down memory in a proper way and to have this continuity of consciousness. And so as you get better at dissociating, you really can't rely on your own experiences as you come back into your body from chronic dissociation. And the brain is finding safety in that protective response and employing it more and more easily. Mm. So yourself and your presence and your joy is going to feel threatening. And just mm. like we talked about before, like you want to change a behavior, you have to have something else in its place. The nervous system regulation becomes that tool to create a presence in your body and also to understand, hey, why did that conversation just trigger me? Like what happened in that landscape, in that scenario with this person or with this experience as to why I had that response in my nervous system? And to speak to that, I always tell people when they start working with us privately, like when you start doing this work, you become an explorer of your nervous system. Mm. It's everything with curiosity. Why did that just happen? And what happened the minute before that? And what happened right before that? Mm -hmm. And then little by little over time, that joy becomes, um, you get more room for it. Mm. You get more room in your nervous system. You've got more space in your nervous system to handle the connection. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And then too, you know, in wondering why you get sick on the other side of it, uh, you know, as Jennifer was saying, like the, the actual, the sensations inside your body are actually stressful when you've been living in a state of chronic dissociation, mm -hmm. your brain has blocked those out because it was too much. And now starting to refuel all of that, it, our brains are predictive. They function on pattern recognition to generate an output. And so there's a lot of threat often attributed to feeling those sensations, mm -hmm. emotions, internal sensations, connection with other people. These things have been possibly very threatening mm -hmm. in the past. And mm -hmm. so our brain is interpreting that as threat and that stress level builds up, right? Especially the bigger the event and the mm -hmm. more people you're coming in contact with and the more you're truly staying present at that event, because I'm sure that you are mm -hmm. because you want to show up as a, as a great coach, mm -hmm. as a great, um, facilitator of the event. And so if you think of your nervous system as a bucket, the water level in that bucket is our stress level and all of our life stress goes into that bucket. And when the bucket is overflowing, that's like red alert, dangerous. Mm. We're entering disease state. The system is going to start to try to shut us down mm. so that we get less stimulus in the bucket. So as you're meeting with all these people, you're taking in all this stuff, the water level is just rising, rising, rising. And then eventually 
our system kicks into those protective outputs that we've talked about. And that can include migraine, Mm. dizziness, vertigo. It can lead to an immune response um, that makes you feel and and be sick. Mm -hmm. And so you are blocking out stimulus in the world. You're going to go lay down. You're going to close the blinds. You're going to interact with people less. You're not going to work out. And in that moment, that is safer for your nervous system because in that moment, the water level comes down because there's less stimulus coming in and our survival mind lives in the present only, Mm -hmm. right? There's no past or future for the survival mind. Mm -hmm. So right then, less stress, it did its job, you're safe. Mm. That's powerful. That is really, really powerful. Yeah, because I'm trying to figure out like, how do I navigate this? Because it's really like my nervous system is not in congruence with how I want to be, (laughs) for a lack of better way of saying it. Like, and it's, again, compared to what my entire family is doing, I'm like, way outside of the realm of, of safety, I would say. And so then you have the, you know, even the, and my family is supportive and kind, but even just the, uh, like the awareness that they're like, Ooh, are you sure you want to do that? Like just that is like, boom, it's like a wildfire and I can feel. And so that's, I think another question that I have is like, just lately with all of this, like, I love the way you said it, like you become sort of like an explorer. You're just like curiosity to your nervous system. That's how I've been this last couple of weeks and months actually. Um, but acutely in the last, we just got back from Nashville and we're considering moving to Nashville with our children. We have two teenagers and an 11 year old. And that has got my nervous system fried. Like it's fried. Like I just don't think I can take it. And now I'm going to cry because I want to be able to take it. And I don't know if I can. And that's causing problems in my relationship. My husband's from the South. He moved here. Like, and this is where I guess this work is so, um, it's so important to me and I'm so thankful for what you do because it's helping me to like see myself with new eyes. But then at the same time, I'm like, how do I make my nervous system be okay with that? And I'm not sure if I can, like, what are your thoughts about something like as stressful as that idea? Like just even from a, or even the idea of like, I want my nervous system to be able to tolerate this, but it can only tolerate that. Like, those are two different questions, but you know, take it away, ladies, <laughs> while I wipe my tears. <laughs> well, I, I, first of all, like, thank you for sharing that. And I, I really feel you like, and, and that's really a lot of the reason why I started this work for, for individuals on the brain based site and for coaches and therapists with neurosomatic intelligence because it sucks. Like it sucks when our high A score and our trauma and our past keep us from being able to live an aligned life. And so many of the people that I know are these like incredible human beings that have such extraordinary visions for the ways they want to impact the world and the life that they want to lead. And they deserve to be able to do that without getting sick Mm -hmm. and shut down. And especially because many of them do come from you know, less than ideal Mm -hmm. childhoods. And, and all of us are carrying this stuff from generations on generations on generations. And now it just seems to be our time to, to deal with it. Mm. And so there has been a long, not a long, there's been a process for me of some acceptance Mm -hmm. about understanding where my nervous system and my body is and knowing that like, as much as I may want to push past what I do, I get better at. And I do have to cultivate a relationship with my body and my nervous system where I recognize the signals that it's sending me and I honor it. Mm -hmm. And that's how I start to develop trust and safety within my nervous system for myself, right? When I really actually hear those signals and respond, then my body and my nervous system start to feel safe trusting me. And that's like the first level of healing. Mm. Um, And then I will say with the nervous system work, it does start gradually, but it is exponential because as I train my nervous system, I get more room in the bucket right? I'm healing all my nervous system deficits. I'm getting more capacity in the bucket. I'm becoming more resilient. And then I can handle more stimulus 
more nervous system training, more new experiences that are creating that positive adaptation. So I start to change faster Mm. and in a bigger way. And so it's not that like I won't ever be able to do these things, but I have to really do them at the speed of my nervous system. Mm. And I have to be pretty dedicated to my nervous system training and to my stress processing, into my like somatic practices that relieve the stress from Mm. inside of me in order to do that because I really want the life that I want. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, sometimes nervous system training is like, ugh, I got to do this again today. But it's also like the most impactful way I've found to have the life that I want. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes worth it for those, you know, those few minutes to, Mm -hmm. to that big expanse of life. And I think one thing to note, too, is that, like, change is inherently threatening to your brain. Mm. So whoever's listening, like, whatever you're experiencing in your world today that you do not want, your brain loves the status quo. It loves whatever you're experiencing right now because those well-worn pathways of protection have been keeping you alive. And this is why behavior change is so challenging for people and self-sabotage becomes a theme in people's lives because if you think about that neural network, Like it's carved. Nope. Mm. Binge. Mm. Shut down. Fatigue. Right. We're going that way. Cue the pain. Mm. Right. And then so when you come in with your nervous system health and you start creating a new pathway, we have to take a step in a new direction when we got to regulate around it. We got to teach the brain and body that this change is what I want and we are safe to make the change. And Mm. sometimes you just stay in that one step. And then sometimes you've got to stay there for a little while. Some days you'll make several steps in a row. And then, you know, taking into consideration that like every time your brain self-sabotages, it's the protective response that it throws out. It's like, oh, you're going that way. No, cue the alcohol. Mm-hmm. Oh, you you went past that? Cue the cannabis. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, throw out that food. Like that self-sabotage is going to keep hitting you if you are not taking the time to regulate your nervous system and give it a new tool to make the change safe Mm -hmm. that you want. You can want it as bad as you want, but that's not enough for your nervous system because getting back to that predictability and that pattern that it's getting used to recognizing, now you're throwing something new at it that it just has no idea. It can't predict Mm -hmm. and it's going to self-sabotage and then cue the shame, right? Mm -hmm. Because like, oh, you've you've messed it up. You couldn't do it. Now here you are. And then that's going to change all of the lens that you're viewing. Mm-hmm. Right. Which I think is even more complicated uh, by the fact, again, that my husband's nervous system, he can tolerate so much more than I can. I mean, the man solo traveled to Dubai. He just does anything. He do- literally does anything. And I'm just not wired to to match that level of like bravery or whatever. And so, you know, in in weaker moments, there's a, there is like a pointed shame thrown at me of, well, if you could do it, we could X. And you're like, well, I suck. You know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a really, really challenging dynamic. Um, And again, I'm not trying to throw my husband under the bus. I just want to highlight like these things happen in relationships, which can make your own healing journey so much more um, like fraught with, you know, like potholes or whatever the word would be. Um, But I want to ask, how are you guys on time? I don't know. I I don't want to go over time too much. Um, If you're still good, we can still chat. But what are you thinking on time? I'm fine on time. I'm fine. Okay, cool. Um, I wanted to ask, um, what are the most common misconceptions people have about the work that you do? Like what, like how do people get it wrong? How do people misunderstand it to, to their detriment or the detriment of their loved ones? I I think it's hard to understand what the tools are. Like it's really hard for, I think it's, it's challenging to communicate what that means. Like people know what breath work is, Mm -hmm. right? People know, cause you see the videos of Mm -hmm. it and we try to post as much as we can about how we use the functional neurology on a day-to-day basis to demonstrate it for people. But I think it it all goes back to that change. And sometimes people will start working with us and just panic mm-hmm. will get set off for them. And they just feel like, no, I've made a mistake because the subconscious mind knows mm-hmm. that you're going to change its patterns and behaviors and its belief systems. And it does not want you to do that. And so it's usually just getting over that first hump, mm. I think, of like, what we're doing here, getting the tools, putting them into practice. And then I, I, it's, 
people love those, um, what do you call it? Those like hacks? What are they called? Like biohacks where something you get like instantaneous. Right. Nervous system regulation is instantaneous. Instantaneous. Like at where whatever you're experiencing, you know, go into the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Go into the bathroom at work. Do a couple drills. Go into the closet at home. Like you can create some space. And so Ooh, um, it's froze. it's fascinating and, and truly empowering. No. Yeah, I would say I think from for me where I see a lot of misconceptions is I think people think that because we are resolving trauma patterns in the body, we're always diving back into mm-hmm. trauma. And we don't do a lot of that around here. We're not reliving the trauma. We're not retelling the stories over and over again. We're just becoming aware of our body's reaction to present day things Mm -hmm. and working to neutralize and change that reaction with practical, actionable tools. So we are not going back and and diving into our past a whole lot. Mm -hmm. It's really about how do we create change in the present and understanding that our past is, does live inside of us in our body and is shaping our reactions, but that's it. Mm -hmm. That's all we have to understand. And then how can we start to reshape it? And then I think also too, people tend to think that like when you're doing trauma informed work, it it necessarily has to be like super, super slow and Mm -hmm. gentle all of the time. Mm -hmm. And that's not really what this is either. So it's really about having the skills and the awareness to understand either how your own nervous system or how your client's nervous system is responding to something. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to calibrate appropriately the right dose for the right individual, because some people do need a lot of stimulus. Some people Mm -hmm. need a lot of different um, activation. And so it's not always slow and gentle. It's what's right for that person's unique nervous system and being able to understand that, assess it, and and dose appropriately for each individual. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I love that. Um, One thing I keep... I feel like you guys talked about this in an earlier episode um, where I think some people struggle to, what would be the word, like claim that what they experienced was traumatic or that it would have some impact on their nervous system. And uh, I'll use an example from my own life. When I was a kid, I fell off of, we had a deck that had no rail on it and it was very high and I fell off of the deck and landed on my stomach and it, it ruptured my spleen. And it was really bad, like bad. I almost died and was taken to the, uh, you know, taken to Harborview in Seattle and all of this stuff. And then I think the following year, or it would have been the year before, had a really terrible car crash with no, um, we had no seatbelts in the car we were in. And so at nine and 10 years old, back to back, like really traumatic events. But for my entire, like growing up, I was like, oh, that, oh, that, that's nothing. But you don't realize like, oh, no like the body keeps the score, that is something. So I want to like maybe allow you guys to expand on some of the things that people might not claim are traumatic experiences and kind of just broaden that for people so they understand. Do you know what I'm asking? Does that make sense? Because that was a good one for me to hear when you guys talked about it. So whichever one wants to go first. Jennifer, how about you? (laughs) Okay. Um, So... I I think a couple of things here, like we know now that trauma is not necessarily the event. It's how it continues to present in Mm. our bodies and in our nervous systems. And it drives the behaviors, emotional experiences, relationship patterns. And I think that a lot of times what happens to us gets brushed off, Mm. that we're just supposed to roll with it. Or get over things, you know, and like people we've, we particularly three, the three of us grew up in times where people weren't recognizing that trauma lives in our body, Mm -hmm. right? That we are been carrying these experiences for potentially decades, right? You don't even have to remember what happened to you. It lives in your body and is responding over and over again in your experiences in the physical realm. And so I think that things get brushed off. I think as we are older and experience traumas, like say boundary via bi- boundary body violations of like the like rape violations, right? Like those kind of body boundary violations. There's a level of shame that can the 
the person can feel when something happens to them. It's like, I shouldn't share that with people because I might lose my tribe. Mm. I might get kicked out. And so there's, I think it's, I think it's multi-layered and I think it's like how we're taught, Mm -hmm. how, you know, and then sometimes, and I mean, that's something that I experienced uh, as a sex trafficking, as a sex trafficking uh, survivor. Mm -hmm. Like I was really scared to share that with people. And I didn't do anything wrong. And I think that happens a lot when we have had experiences where we didn't do anything wrong, but something really bad has happened to Mm -hmm. us. And then it's like, I don't really want to claim that cognitively, right? but your body has claimed it. Like, Mm -hmm. and, and you are going to get whatever lives in your body is going to continue to get re-triggered. I mean, we live in a very dysregulating world. There's a lot of stress. Oh, I hope I'm, answered that right yeah 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 absolutely and i think too like it's just important when we restructure the idea of trauma is it's the way that our body has adapted to respond to stress Mm -hmm. and so that can be like a big t trauma like the one that you described which is definitely a a a real deal medical big t trauma Mm -hmm. and when something that's that stressful happens our body remembers it very strongly because it was very life-threatening. And remember survival brain's number one job. Mm -hmm. Always we are wired for survival first. And so it's going to be very hypervigilant about recognizing any kind of signals that remind it of that Mm -hmm. and then producing a protective response in, in that way. But it can also be like trauma can be like death by a thousand paper cuts, right? Like if you're growing up in an environment where you have all these little stressors that accumulate over time, your body is still patterning to adapt to that stress and to create a response. And so still, when things remind you of that, Mm -hmm. your body will react in a in a protective way, in a way where it can get triggered into one of the four Fs, where it can um, be activated in a certain state. So say you experience a lot of emotional neglect and it's not one big instance, but just throughout your whole Mm -hmm. childhood growing up, it's not very safe to express emotions. Mm -hmm. And then you feel an emotion and suddenly it comes out in front of someone, right? And you're here on this podcast and, oh my God, you cried. Mm -hmm. And now Cognitively, you might know that that's okay, Mm -hmm. but what your body has learned over time, especially during development, is that that is not safe. Mm -hmm. Cue the protective responses, the inflammation, the activation, the racing heart, Mm -hmm. the sweaty palms, right? All of Mm -hmm. that. And so it's, it's really just our body's reaction to what it's learned over the span of our life Mm -hmm. to protect us. Mm. That's so helpful to hear. And it makes me think I'm going to just share like a few, a few things. This was really helpful to have somebody um, looked at me. So we, we've gone through a pretty rough last like year and a half. My, um, the trigger warning, my oldest brother passed in a not great way. Um, and it was, I, I didn't realize like walking through it, how intense it was until someone looked at me and went, Hey, you've just been through trauma. And I was like, well, no, no, because like I had to help my parents and I had to do this. And it was like, it wasn't my trauma. It was that. And they're like, no, you have been through trauma. And just hearing that, like the, re- like the freedom that that gave me to like move through sadness and grief and all of the things that I had like not realized that I was, I thought, well, it wasn't, I didn't die. It wasn't me. It was somebody else. So I shouldn't X, Y, Z. Right. And so I'm, I really am saying this in hopes that it helps someone else feel the sort of like, I don't know, freedom sounds like the wrong word, but freedom to be like, hey, that was traumatic. Like it was traumatic when you got in a car accident. It was traumatic when, I mean, for example, one of my kids fell off of a, 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 a we were at a, a park when he was two years old, fell off of like a super high play structure. Totally fine. He was totally fine. But that was really traumatic. That's like kids break their backs and break their necks doing exactly what my son did. And I watched him. Right. So things like that. Um, again, I feel like I'm just sharing weird stuff, but I'm helping. I want to <laughs> doing it on purpose. Uh, a couple years ago, I cut my whole finger open with a chainsaw. You heard the words that I just said. It was really traumatic. My children were all there. Thank the Lord. I was totally fine. I was 
I was staring at my bone, which is amazing, but I could have been, I mean, I could have cut my face open. I could have cut my shoulder. Like these are traumatic events, like witnessing a car crash, earthquakes, like, and I'm, I'm not trying to just be scary and triggering. So I hope it doesn't come across that way. But genuinely, I'm trying to say like, I was downplaying things that were causing me so much nervous system dysregulation because I thought I shouldn't be upset about that. I shouldn't be that sensitive. I shouldn't whatever. And so I think I was like just training myself to make myself sick because my body, I don't even know. I don't even know if that's the right way to say it, but that's how it felt. Mm -hmm. So part of me is just saying like, well, number one, listen to all of Trauma Rewired. Listen to all of the shows and learn more from these amazing ladies because I I think it was so freeing to be like, no, that is little T trauma, big T trauma. It doesn't really matter. It's still a thing that you should and can look at and can heal from and can grow from, but not if you pretend it isn't there. Not if you feel yeah, like- that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Keep keep talking about that. Well, I mean, by by downplaying our own trauma, one, we're like eroding trust in ourself mm. because we're not validating our own experience, right? But even- beyond that, um, you know, we can't resolve the trauma if we suppress it or repress it. Mm. And that's what keeps us stuck in the activated states. It's what keeps the emotions held inside of the body, causing disease, causing inflammation. And so when we can allow ourselves to be like, yeah, something happened, because here's the deal, both you and your husband have experienced traumatic events mm -hmm. and stressful events. It, it, it's never just one person in yeah. a partnership. So just so you know that too. Um, and when we go through these things, if we can acknowledge them and see them and then mobilize that energy through the body, do mm -hmm. things to release it somatically, use our neurosomatic tools to re-regulate, then process the emotions, the grief, the anger, the all the things that come up with it, knowing that that's just a normal human reaction to living in the world, mm. to being a human being. And then we can start to let it move through us. And then we don't keep living our life reactivated, re-triggered, stressed out and diseased. We just can, can move through it. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Um, and one final thing I will ask, although I could talk to you for basically the rest of my life, uh, but is it sounds like what you're saying again, and this is me kind of asking a two part for myself, but also for our listeners, part of my brain just wants to go, well, can't I just think my way out of it? Like, that's how I want to my, my yeah, I want to be like, I can just think my way out of it. Right. But what I'm hearing you're saying, you saying is like, it's this embodied, I mean, that's the whole point of what you're talking about, but speak more to this, like, no, you cannot just think your way out of it. And it's a whole embodied thing. Can you just share as much as you want about that? You definitely cannot just think your way out of it. Like it just, it, it really doesn't work like that. We are embodiment is that, that connection between the mind and the body where you know, you can be who, who you are. And the thing about cognitively thinking about it is that you, when you cut your body off, I mean, your body remembers mm. things that your mind doesn't remember, mm. right? So how are you cognitively thinking about something when the body's got hidden truths in it that you are completely shutting down and not even recognizing? Like, your your body is always going to remember and they're just like we're talking about the world being very dysregulating like i have a strong fight trauma response right that's a very well worn path for me fight so no matter how much i work on that all i can do is understand that that's what's being activated in my system because that is never going away mm -hmm. your 4f trauma responses are reflexive and we live in a world i mean your nervous system is going to get triggered mm -hmm. that is just what it is, right? And so to leave your body out of the equation, like even for me, if I say, well, my fight response is triggered right now, I can totally recognize that. And then I do nothing about it. In real time, suppressing that emotion, it's just going into a well mm -hmm. of more emotions that have never been expressed. Mm -hmm. And they're like, they're like clogged drains in the body is what I like to say. Like what exists underneath of that rage and that anger and that mm. pain and chaos? There's my joy and my vitality. And so 
I really think that in our experiences, like this comes up a lot in psychedelic spaces, the word integration, Mm -hmm. but integration is something that we are doing all of the time. It's that downtime and processing time. And it's this, you know, it's this understanding of our experiences and what we've just been through and how can we tap into the connection of what we just been through and bring it into a sense of peace in our bodies and in our in our worlds with tools that foster awareness and presence and connection with your body with your emotions and understanding that rest and fun and play are big components of a healing process and of a healthy nervous system and that slowing down is a really essential process mm. for you to to be in. So like if you're in a car accident or something just happens and you think, oh, that wasn't really a big deal. And then you just bypass that integration time and like what you just experienced in your body, you're just, you're just shoving it down and repressing it. And um, eventually it's going to, it's it's just going into the bucket, right? It's going to overflow. Yeah, definitely. I feel like most of my life I was like, the queen of cognitive bypass and completely relied on my intellect as a coping skill to get me, to keep me alive, Mm -hmm. tell me survive. Right. And if I could just override all of this stuff, if I could figure it out, Mm -hmm. then it'd be fine. And did a lot of cognitive therapy and all of that to address my stuff. And, you know, I I don't know if I need a trigger warning here for this, but I do have early childhood sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And so from an early age, it was like, I didn't even want to have a body. I would mm. rather never feel this. Mm. And I, so I, I detached from my body a long time ago. And coming back into the body was very scary. Mm. But here's the deal. It doesn't work differently. Like it just, if, if I could have done it that way, I would have, and I would have been successful mm-hmm. and it would have been great. But that's just not the way that we work. We're whole connected organisms. There isn't actually any separation between our brain and our body and our nervous system. They are always in communication with each other. They are always functioning together. My body is driving my behavior as much as my thoughts are. And my autonomic nervous system is controlling the internal state of my body. And my brain is filtering all the information that comes in through my body. And so you really can't parcel Mm. them apart. I mean, I'm not a brain in a jar Mm. being wheeled around through the world, you know? And so if I want to have a new experience of life and I want it, just like you were talking about, I want to be able to have that aligned life Mm -hmm. and move out of the behaviors that don't serve me and feel and be present, then I, I have to move beyond the skill of only intellectually dealing with everything. Mm -hmm. And I have to find a way to help my body and my nervous system be safe in that life and safe with those experiences and learn tools for regulation. And that just, that just is, that's just the way it is. That's amazing. So you call it cognitive bypass? Is that what it's called? (laughs) Where you're just like, (laughs) yeah, you can call it that or intellectualizing or, you know, being uh, like understanding and not knowing in the body. Like yeah. you can hear people talk about it all kinds of different ways. Mm-hmm. Spiritually bypassing is another way to try to get out of feeling the body and having the messiness of emotions mm-hmm. and regulation and dysregulation. And, you know, it's just as scary as it is, you know, I am now today, like I'm able to be present with you. I can do this podcast and I'm not going to go binge afterwards. Mm-hmm. I'm able to be in a partnership where I am actually there and connected. I can play around. I can have fun. I can experience mm-hmm. pleasure. Like, that's, that's real. Yeah. And I, I'm not just thinking about it. I'm not saying, wow, what, what would it be like to feel pleasure? Pleasure feels like A, B, C, and D. This is what happens in my body when the experience of pleasure happens. It's no, like I know it. I feel it. I can experience life. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And I feel like, man, I've got a lot of healing to do, but I'm really excited that I have the podcast as a resource for me to understand these things. And you ladies are just phenomenal. Like I 
was telling my ladies in my group, I'm like, I need to talk to them before they get so famous that they won't let me on their show. Because <laughs> y'all are and headed to the moon. I mean, honestly, Melanie, too, like, come, you come do the free two weeks. Like, it, you come do the rewire trial and come get some tools with us. We would love to have you on site with us. And for anyone, if they're hearing themselves yeah. in this conversation and want to work with the nervous system to create resilience. Right. And the capacity to love your life, enjoy it, be present with it. Yeah. yeah, come to rewiretrial.com. Like, we would love it. I should have all my ladies do it together. That would be so much fun. I mean, we, that would just be a blast. Yes. Please do. It yeah. really Please. is fun. We do it in community. Yeah. We have fun with it. We hang out afterwards and answer questions. Mm-hmm. Like, you're there working with us. And so, yeah, we, we would love that. It's just rewiretrial.com. Mm-hmm. And also, like, don't sell yourself short on all the healing that you've done. And, you know, I, I know it feels sometimes like, oh my God, there's so much space between where I am now and this healed version of myself that I want to be. But like, also like, look at everything that you've created and that you've done. And like, there's just always more, there's always more layers, but like, you know, good job. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Definitely. I mean, totally I really agree. Like yeah. you're here with this podcast, like you're a creator. And you're doing great. And you said something earlier. You said, I'm just not wired that way. And I didn't want to interrupt you, but I'm just like, no, not yet. Mm. You know, back to the neuroplasticity, you can rewire and have and create any experience that you want to live and participate in, in in this life and in this world and in your body. Oh, that's amazing. I really appreciate that. And your guys' kind feedback and words is just... It's so lovely. Uh, Well, I want to just respect your time and thank you so much for taking your time to be here today, to answering our questions. Um, And I do... I do want to let you guys go because I know you've got a lot going on and things that you're doing, but I want to say really quickly, before I hopped on this call, uh, one of the women from my group sent me a text and she said... She had an inter- she she was driving to get her pick to pick up her kids from school and had some sort of like run in with a police officer and the police officer was like speaking really abruptly to her and she's like old me would have shut off run home and binged and she's like and I had and this is literally happened today like right before this call started and she's like from our conversation and listening to trauma rewired she's like I realized that this was reflect like it was like a reflection of how she had grown up where her dad was really authoritative but like punitive and punished her when she's like, I didn't need to be spanked, but he would spank me anyway. And she's like, and just the awareness and connecting these dots. I didn't go home and binged. I did yoga and I read a book quietly. And I was, and she shared it with like a group, a thread of us ladies. And I was like, yes, this is what healing looks like. Like it's possible. So I just, I'm so deeply thankful for the work that you two do. I might have to have you back on to talk about a bunch of more stuff because this was really, really informative and helpful. And again, to any of you guys listening, please go subscribe to Trauma Rewired. Go to say your website again so they can get the two week free trial. What is it again? Rewiretrial.com to Perfect. get your two free weeks. Yes. And I will sign up with that with some of my ladies though. So I want to do it with friends because that'd be super fun. Um, and, and seriously, thank you again. And where else can people find anything that you want them to find of you before we wrap up? That's really the best place. Just head over to rewiretrial.com and you can sync up with us there. That'll get you on the news list too. And then trauma rewired. Perfect. And thank you so much for sharing that story with the police officer and your friend. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Thank you. It really has been a joy. Yes. It really has been. Thank you so much. Well, have an uh, an amazing rest of your day. Keep on doing awesome work. And I cannot wait for the new uh, like season to come out all about relationships. It's going to be exciting. So have a wonderful day and thank you again. I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Bye. Thanks for listening to Anatomy of Us. This podcast is produced by my mom, Melanie Studley, and hosted by my dad, Seth Studley. Our show is edited and published by our producer, Reva Hansen, from Creative Media Support. Special thanks to our Patreon members that get an extra episode every week. Thanks for watching. Love you. Bye. (laughs) 